So again, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk about voice a customer. Uh, and uh, I want to really focus in on, on hopefully people in the call, this might be new to you, uh, about how voice a customer can actually help make uh, your business uh, more successful. And I've been working now with a lot of startups over the last four years. And this is one area where uh, many companies, both large and small, uh, quite frankly, don't spend enough time. So again, there's me. I'm uh, not showing my uh, picture today because uh, my back, my computer doesn't allow uh, good virtual backgrounds. And you really don't want to see my face anyway. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, and then if you uh, need to uh, follow up with me directly by email, again, you'll have this available to me to uh, to you you can see my email and also uh, if you want to contact the SPDC uh, there's our information as well um, so this I thought would be an interesting place to begin and it's it's surprising to me how many companies I interact with and this is not only the companies of startups uh, but actually some very large companies that quite frankly don't like to talk to customers so again, uh, for those, you know, talk to customers and what do customers have to do with the products we eventually want to buy. And there's many companies that I've spoken to, a lot of entrepreneurs who have what they think is are great ideas. They develop this great idea. And this could also happen at large company. They can spend thousands, if not millions of dollars to develop the product only to find out when they go to market that nobody wants to buy their product. So one of the things that I hope you take home from this presentation is before you spend any money, before you actually ask investors or family and friends to invest in your company, you actually do voice a customer. You actually go out and, and not talk to customers, you actually go out and listen to customers. And I'll spend a few more minutes about the difference between those two words. So, what is the voice of customer process? It's here in the slide here. It's, it's a market research technique. And it's really a process that you're gonna run throughout your entire life cycle of your business to really understand your customer's expectations, their likes and their dislikes. It really helps you to identify both their stated customer requirements or needs, but also their unstated customer requirements or needs. And that's what's really important when I talk about the different processes that you can use to actually uncover both of those. Uh, you typically use those to identify customer pain points with however they're doing, whatever they're doing today with similar products. Again, many entrepreneurs think they have developed something new and exciting that nobody in the world has ever thought of and that there, there's no competition for their products and there's nothing further from the truth on that. There's always competition for your products and your competition is either direct competition or it just might be the way your customers are getting the job done today. And I'll perhaps give you a few anecdotes about that which might not be readily apparent. Um, but again, they're doing things a certain way today, and that's, that's your competition. You, VOC helps you identify key attributes for making a purchase decision. So really understanding how and why, why somebody buys something and the process they use to buy something and the attributes they look at are critically important for your business. Uh, it's actually more critical to understand that than the actual development of the product. And again, VOC, because you're actually going to do VOC the entire time you have your business, it enables you to capture changing preferences of clients in time. So this is really important for a lot of startups who are taking two, three, four, and five years to develop their product. And so they might have gone out and talked, spoken with customers in their first year. And then they went into the lab or they went into their business. They spent three or four years developing the product, never talking to another customer again, only to find out when they came to market, 
conditions have changed. And we're living that right now in real time with COVID-19. COVID-19 has had a dramatic changes on every business on the planet. And a lot of people don't recognize that customer preferences have changed. I think everybody is recognizing that now and realizing that they have to change with it or their customers are not going to be buying their products. So I'm going to speak to some of these today, but I want to uh, list all the various techniques that you can use for voice a customer. I have preferred ones, but these are all, all I've used all of these and they all have their place. Uh, so as an example, you can run a focus group and a focus group is where you might get four or five or 10 customers or, or potentially more in a panel. And you can ask them a series of questions. You can do this in a blinded way where you hire somebody not associated with the company to actually do it and they don't disclose who they're doing it for. Or you can do it unblinded where the company itself is doing it. Both techniques are, are viable. Uh, customer interviews. Uh, there's services out there where you can actually do phone interviews in a recorded uh, fashion. There's a company in Costa Mesa called InVibe who has a business around this. Uh, I've used that company. It's actually an interesting way to do VOC, uh, primarily because it's fast. And I can, I'm not going to talk about InVibe per se today, but if you have questions, I'll try and answer it. You can do customer surveys like SurveyMonkey, and there's a place for that, but there's some challenges as well. Social media is a great place to get voice to customer. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and, and other types of social media. If you have a website, you can do a lot of VOC on your own website uh, with Google Analytics and other types of technology uh, from, from the web. And then a specific type of VOC is what's known as a conjoint or a trade-off assessment. And this is a very important technique that you might use when you're actually uh, developing your product and you're developing your, your requirements to really find out which requirements are more important than other re requirements in the customer purchasing decision. And a lot of companies, again, don't take advantage of this. They end up putting hundreds of requirements into their product only to find out that it's only four or five uh, critical uh, requirements that customers make their decision on. So here's a little uh, grid. Again, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. You could have a copy of, uh, of this later, which looks at the, from my point of view, and this is my point of view, others might have a different point of view, various attributes of these different types of uh, techniques uh, and whether they are favorable, a, a good technique to use for that particular attribute, what I view as neutral or what I view as unfavorable. Another thing to keep in mind is that voice of customer, depending on how you do it, can be quantitative in nature, and there's a reason to do that, uh, or qualitative in nature. Uh, and some of the techniques uh, can be used for uh, both quantitative and qualitative uh, characteristics, while other ones uh, are more specific to, uh, to one or the other. So as an example, interviews, that's a personal interview. It used to be we did these face-to-face uh, or on the telephone or now through Zoom or, or Skype or some other uh, video conference. Um, they, I generally like them because uh, they're, they're middle of the road as far as cost. Uh, but what I really like, like the most about them are the green circles. And it really allows you to get intimate with the customer to really understand uh, what they're saying to ask for clarity, for probe, for more detail. This is a wonderful technique that I use to look for body language. So I'm looking for, for unstated uh, clues for how they're responding to my questions. 
It's also uh, important to listen to the actual words that they use to describe their likes and dislikes. So you, interviews you can use to, gra to, to gather emotion uh, to a particular question, which is very difficult to get, like, for example, in a survey. So the first three ones that, that I have here, I like the most because it allows me to get that intimacy and helps me uh, uh, learn a lot more about the, uh, the customer buying behaviors. So it's interviews, focus groups, and observation. Observation's a great technique to use if you can. I know it's, it's hard right now during COVID-19 where you actually see your customers in action doing whatever they're doing today to solve to, that, your pro, that your particular product or service is going to uh, improve or solve. But quite frankly, all these techniques are, are useful. And uh, I, I would advise all of you to experiment with all those to find out which ones work best for your business. And again, I use all of them in my own businesses and with, it, with all my clients because they all have a place in the business life cycle. So before you actually start out on voice a customer, you have to ask yourself the question is, who is my customer? And more often than not, many startup companies and quite frankly, even some large companies don't actually recognize who their customer is. Now, customers are generally defined as the person or, or function that's actually making the purchasing decision. They're the ones that are going to pay you the cash. Uh, so here I have uh, a few that could be. So if you're selling a medical device that a surgeon is going to use, you might think the surgeon is your customer. And in many cases, that's correct. So if you go to a surgical center, uh, like an outpatient center where the surgeons actually own the practice, the surgeons own the building, the surgeons uh, are the, uh, the equity partners, and the surgeons are the ones that are gonna be using your tool or device, they might be your actual customer. However, in other places, let's say in a large university hospital like UCI or a large uh, hospital network that have maybe 12, 15, or 20 hospitals in their network, the surgeons are the users of the product, but the people that make the purchase and decision might be the chief medical officer, the chief surgical officer, or if the price tag is big enough, it actually might be the CFO or the CEO. So the reason I'm mentioning that is that you really have to understand who your customer is because you actually want to do interviews with your customers. However, in the medical area where I spend a lot of time, all the ones that we have here on the board are actually key in the overall buying process. So more often than not, the doctors or the lab or the users, whereas the purchasing decisions are made by the CEO or by the purchasing department. You see the purchasing agent there. But all the other people that I have listed here are key to the overall buying processes because they are big influencers. And so comprehensive VOC actually takes all of this into account. And you really want to understand the key buying attributes, the key drivers for making a purchasing decision uh, from all of uh, all these different uh, types of people. And clearly in the medical area, you can't leave out the payers and the payers are typically the insurance company. I have here United Healthcare, but it, it can be more than that. Keep in mind, I think right now in the US, there's over 250 different insurance companies involved in, in the US healthcare marketplace. Uh, so it's, sometimes it's worthwhile to actually talk to the payers as you work through your VOC. So I've outlined here what I would say is a typical voice of customer process. 
you can see it here. You actually have to do a lot of planning before you actually take, go to this place right here. It starts with developing, identifying what you think your business issue is. And VOC for the most part is a very scientific method. You actually always start with a hypothesis that you're going to test through this process. And your hypothesis might be that whatever the customer is doing now is causing them a lot of pain and they want a replacement of it. Uh, so you actually want to actually form, and I actually form a, a physical hypothesis. Uh, and then I decide what's the best method for collecting information. So how am I going, what kind of data do I want to collect? How do I want to collect that data? Which ultimately leads me to develop my voice of customer approach. In the case of interviews, it's what kind, I actually write the questions and I'll show you some of those later. Then you actually go execute on the VOC. There's a process that I will suggest on executing a VOC. Uh, it's not something I would jump, if you've not done this before, I would not jump in and start talking to 50 customers right off the bat. It actually takes practice to get this right. And then you go through, once you get, execute the VOCs is actually analyzing and interpreting the data and then drawing your conclusions. And two of the big conclusions that typically come out of a VOC process are customer needs and also product requirements. And quite frankly, it's, as I said earlier, and you're gonna hear me repeat this several times, it's not a one and done. Often you have to do several rounds of VOCs to get, to really understand the true customer needs and to actually really have a good understanding of the key or essential product requirements for your product or services business. So when should you perform VOC? Uh, the glib answer is you never stop performing VOC. You're always doing it. Uh, I often see most companies doing it at this stage and then they forget about it. And as I said, if you have a long cycle time, if you're developing a product over months or years, uh, it's important that you do it all across this process because again, life changes around you. Customers' perceptions change, competition changes, your competition's not sitting still. Uh, so it's important to uh, stay on, on, on top of the situation. I'll give you a real life situation in my own career. At my last corporate job at Beckman, I was developing a real-time PCR system, sample and answer out. We started in, in this process. We decided to launch in Europe. That's where our focus was. We identified 996 customers in five countries who were performing infectious disease and molecular diagnostic testing. And we actually interviewed, uh, uh, actually we started this worldwide. We first went out and talked to, a, again, we're a big company, we could afford this. We actually did 100 face-to-face -face interviews around the world. We drew a hypothesis, series of hypotheses from those 100 face-to-face -face interviews. We then did a thousand telephone calls, again, big company, but we did a thousand calls around the world to validate those hypotheses, to help identify the product. The product took several years to develop. So two years later, we actually repeated that entire process. And then right before product launch, as I said, we, we launched in Europe and we interviewed 960 customers in Europe, once again, prior to the launch. So again, uh, I really, this was very uh, useful for us because this product was the best launch I ever had uh, in, in launching a, a product. We actually got very rapid market adoption. But again, I would ask, look at all parts of the product life cycle from your idea stage to defining your product. And I've listed some of the different techniques you might use 
in each of these phases. While you're doing your product and product design, you might want to take your product out and get some feedback during that. Uh, again, for medical devices, we do verification and validation, and a lot of times that's done at customer sites. But you're getting more information, not only about how your product performs, but how your software looks, how your the touch and feel, the look and feel of your product, you get valuable feedback. And then while you're out into the market, you're constantly listening to customers about the, your product's feedback, which might feed into the next phase of your business, the next product that you're developing. So really uh, a little bit more detail, how can VOC help you make a better decisions? Uh, so if you're looking at a new product, and uh, I've talked about this before in my last talk around customer segments, uh, voice a customer can help you identify what segments of the market best fit your product or service, what customers exist, what are the key needs of each segment, how attractive that segment is, and what strengths do you have to reach that particular segment. And again, the various VOC methods, you can do a segmentation study, you can do a product position or a value proposition study, uh, and you can use a lot of available internal information you have from your own connections, uh, as well as external uh, information. Uh, a lot of companies that are already existent try and use VOC to uh, actually understand how they can actually retain customers. And what a lot of companies fail to realize, they're always trying to, uh, it's much easier and much cheaper to figure out how to keep a customer than to try and get a new customer. So we typically use VOC with our existing businesses to better understand how to satisfy your existing customers. Well, once again, Customer requirements, customer demands, customer needs change over time. And again, we can only think of COVID-19 and what's happening in the world to really understand that. And I think this is a great uh, learning exercise for many companies. Uh, some company, many companies will fail uh, during this unfortunate pandemic, but a lot of companies are figuring this out and they're gonna take advantage of uh, I know it, it sounds sad that I'm saying this, but they're going to take advantage of this horrible situation and thrive. And there are a number of companies out there right now talking to a lot of people, a lot of their customers to try and understand how their needs are changing and how they can pivot their company uh, to fit those needs. So now let me spend a few more minutes and on the next, next couple of slides around customer interviews, which is my preferred way of doing a VOC because I get to listen to my customer. I get to ask clarifying questions. And most importantly, I get to watch my customer. Uh, you can do them two ways. I prefer face-to-face, -face, but that's not possible today as, as it was in the past. Uh, but quite frankly, Skype, uh, Zoom, uh, and all the other uh, video conferences uh, seem to work quite well. Uh, I like to target if you're first starting out uh, with a goal to uh, interview at least 20 to 50 customers. Uh, statistical significance isn't gonna happen till you probably get to the 40 or 50 uh, level. It's tough to do statistics when you're only talking to 20 customers. So if you're talking to 20, I think you'll get good qualitative information. You'll start to see trends in the responses, but it really takes you to get to 50 or even 100 customers for you to get uh, statistically valid uh, numbers. But I like interviews because you really can get a deep understanding of whatever you're trying uh, uh, to find out, and you use this when a range of possible answers is not known. So this is really a discovery process, which many companies use when they're first starting out uh, developing a product or service. And as I mentioned, how do you do this? You do this one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face. -face. 
And uh, if you've not done this before, uh, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's difficult for a lot of scientists and engineers to do this. Uh, probably it will insult all the millennials or the generation, whatever your disease now, where we actually don't like talking to people. Uh, so it, as I said, it's often hard, but from my own experience and the experience I've had with a lot of startups, after you do four or five interviews, it, it actually gets fairly easy and it starts to get to be a lot of fun. So you, it's really an interactive method to collect complete, accurate, and fair information from the customer's viewpoint. And again, I'll show you some questions later. You ask open-ended questions. You never ask a question that gives you a yes or no, because that's the only answer you're gonna get. And it really gives you the under, the opportunity to ask follow-up questions for clarity. So often I write a, a VOC questionnaire of maybe 20 questions. By the way, that's just my guide. I actually don't look at the questions when I'm asking them. I rarely get through all 20 questions because I'm starting to get some very interesting answers to some of my early questions. And then I try and ask follow-up questions to go a, a lot deeper to get a much deeper understanding uh, of that particular point. The biggest challenge uh, for most uh, entrepreneurs is to learn how to listen. So uh, uh, something that I, that I do with my clients right now is I, I coach them over and over again. I want you to ask a question and then be quiet. Don't say anything. The, the customer might be thinking, be quiet for 10, 15, or 20 seconds to get the customer to start talking. And then let them talk until they actually come to the end of their thought and then ask a follow-up question. So voice a customer is all around listening and less about talking uh, about your product. Again, with face-to-face -face interviews, there's several cons to it. So I've already talked about the pros yeah, you have a lot of flexibility. You can actually look at eye contact. You can have eye contact. You can look at body language and you can, and you can listen to the actual vocabulary, vocabulary they're using, the strength of the adjectives that they're using to describe something. Coupled with their body language can tell you a lot about how they're thinking about your question. The cons are it's it can be costly. It can be lengthy. These are typically half hour to hour conversations. It's really hard to schedule these interviews. A lot of people don't like to spend an hour talking to somebody they don't know. Uh, there can be interruptions during the interview, phones, and vit so you have to do things to try and avoid that. And then you have to think about spending time listening as opposed to taking notes. So if possible, I suggest you find two people to do this interview, these interviews. One to be asking the questions and interacting with the customers and another one working behind the scenes taking all the notes. It's also possible for you to record these conversations but only if you get permission from the customer. So again, you can read the do's, uh, beware of your own, uh, and uh, the respondent's facial and body expressions. So you have to keep yourself neutral. Uh, you have to maintain good eye contract and uh, all, all pretty common sense. And, and I've seen this happen before and you have to learn how to shut your phone off so you're not being interrupted. And I already talked about a lot of the don'ts. So all common sense things, but uh, your main target there is to ask a few questions and listen. So how do you, how do you actually get interviews? The best way to get interviews is to talk to people you know. So, um, or, so I like to find, and again, the medical area, either find a consultant who knows some folks or maybe you can know some people your own if you're coming out of UCI your own professors 
Uh, if you're over at the med school, go talk to some of the clinicians there. Uh, try and find people that you know who will give you an hour of their time. Uh, and after the last question, I always ask them before I say thank you uh, for your time, I say, can you introduce me to two or three of your colleagues? And often uh, people say yes, and 50% of the time they actually do it. So they give you a warm introduction uh, to the next couple of people on your list. And through that process, you can typically get to 50 or up to uh, 100 customers. Unfortunately, it could take several months to do that. Uh, so again, you can do telephone, you can do face-to-face. -face. Uh, I've just done a successful, I'm actually in the process of doing VOC where we use LinkedIn. We put out a, a call on LinkedIn uh, to do a VOC study and uh, we, we received uh, a lot of responses and we're actually working our way through those responses. Uh, the only challenge I have with a lot of the online tools, it based on who responds to you, uh, you might be getting a biased population. So you just have to think about that. I talked about referrals. If you know a competing organization or you have friends who are in your industry who are in sales, uh, they can be uh, great connections for, uh, for talking to customers. And then one that I used successfully before COVID-19, uh, went to various scientific conferences, business conferences, uh, and walked through the exhibit halls and, and pretty much walked up to people, uh, struck up a conversation, found mutual areas of interest, and then used that uh, to set up interviews. All these are useful techniques. Uh, but again, a lot of them uh, take a bit of time uh, and effort to, to be successful. As far as uh, how, you, how you do that, again, you have to develop a, a discussion guide. And I, I suggest you write what you want to try to address during these interviews, but it's a guide for you. It's not a questionnaire. And you really want to use these questions to provoke open discussions. I, I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm doing it for emphasis. And if a customer is going down a particular area that they're showing great interest, dig deep into that interest, as opposed to just trying to get through your list of questions. And as, as much as possible, um, don't be that prescriptive because you're really just trying to have a conversation with another human being. And then the big challenge for most of us is to not make the guy too long. It'd be very unusual for you to get more than an hour's worth of time from somebody. And I typically try and uh, plan my VOCs to only last 30 minutes and hopefully they go uh, longer if, if there's a lot of interest. There's one other technique which I didn't put on the slide here, which does work. And I think it's well worth the investment. If you're having trouble getting people to do VOC for free, offer them some money. And I typically have been offering uh, between, we've been offering between $100 to $300 Amazon gift cards for some to spend an hour of time uh, with us. Um, for a lot of companies, they think that's, ex that's ex expensive, but um, letting everybody know if you don't do VOC up front before you actually start on your product, you're gonna think about, isn't it worth spending maybe two, three or $4,000 up front to find out that you're gonna develop the right product then spend hundreds of thousands of dollars only to find out later that nobody wants your product. And I can't tell you how many times I've run across this, not only with startups, but from Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 100 companies. Who remembers the, Co what was it, Coke Zero? Or some of the products that, that you've seen come out the market that have just absolutely failed from major companies. And I think it's primarily because they didn't do adequate VOC. 
before they started developing the product. So you're gonna have these slides later so you can look at these, these questions, but I've written three, uh, three slides of typical questions uh, that can give you an indication if you're just starting out. I try and collect demographic information because it helps me with my segmentation. So if I'm talking to a physician, how many patients do you see? How often do you see patients? How many patients do you see a day? What are the age of your patients? What's your specialty? Whatever that might be that you're trying, trying to, uh, to do. I, I do a lot of lab, a lot of diagnostics. Uh, so if, uh, like even in the COVID-19 uh, area, we're asking questions, uh, how many COVID-19 uh, patients uh, samples are you doing a day? What type of samples are you getting? Again, NP swabs, OP swabs, saliva, whatever. How fast are you getting those results back to your physician? So trying to get, again, some demographic information and then starting to ask broad, open-ended questions uh, to, uh, to generate a lot deeper uh, conversation. So again, you'll have these available for you uh, later. I'll just pause on each one here so you can see some of the types of questions you might ask. And the whole idea in asking these questions is to find out what they're doing today, why they chose whatever they're doing today, how did they make that decision, and, and, and what criteria did they use? What do they like about the product that they're using today? What don't they like about the product that they're using today? If they could describe an ideal product to solve their solution or service, what would it look like? These are really wide open questions uh, that can lead to uh, very interesting conversations and quite frankly take up uh, the entire 30 minutes or 60 minutes of the interview. Uh, these are uh, some questions to identify pain points and also trade-off analysis. So sometimes you think that cost is the most important criteria, but it's often not. It might be. So a lot of these criteria for product are, are trade-offs. Is tech time or the time it takes to do a procedure, a surgical procedure, more important than the cost of the product? And again, you can see some of the other ones uh, that I've identified that I've asked here to identify various pain points. So in my last couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about the interview process that I like to use. I, after I do all my planning and I write my questionnaires, I try and interview five customers and only five customers. After that five, I do a pause and I assess what I'm learning. I actually, look at the questions and the answers I'm getting and asking myself, am I getting the information that I need? More often than not, I, I have some questions that I'm asking correctly. Now the ones that I'm not getting the information that I need because I didn't either pose a question correctly or it's just not important, important for that customer. So I actually revise the questions and then I interview the next five. And then I repeat that process again. It typically takes me about up to seven to 10 interviews to know that I actually have the right approach for a face-to-face -face interview, which is why I then like to now use that process for the next 30, 40 to 50 people. And again, uh, and then I wanna use to those results to analyze customer segments, pain points, buying criteria, and the key product attributes that are desired. One of the things I did not mention uh, during this whole process, if you're just starting a business, my advice to you, and this is my strong advice, whatever you do, don't talk about your product. This is not a time to find out if somebody's gonna love your product. If you bring your product or your idea up to a customer, 
you've just biased the entire interview process. Your whole point of doing early VOC, if you're just starting a business out, is to learn about your customer, learn about their processes, learn about how they buy things and why they buy things, learn about what they like about products, and learn about their dislikes. It's a learning process. And then once you have that information, you can look at it and then go back to your product idea and see if your product idea actually addresses some or all of those issues. So I'm gonna use one anecdote. I had a, a client just a couple of weeks ago. I won't mention the client's name. They're still a client of mine. They had a great idea for uh, augmented reality to help uh, uh, a certain medical practice. Uh, so telemedicine with, with augmented reality. And uh, I suggested this entire process to him before, and he already had developed it. He started laying out the attributes of the product. And I asked him how many customers, have he, how many, in this case, physicians or clinicians has he talked to? And he said, just one or two. I said, hey, why don't you go out and talk to about 10? So I went out and talked to uh, a bunch of them and we actually met two weeks ago. He came back and he was so happy. I said, why are you so happy? He says, I'm so happy because I found out my product idea is not gonna work. I found out what I wanted to do. They already had a very simple technique to do it. Again, it was telemedicine. Uh, they, he, uh, I won't describe it because I don't want to describe what the product was, but uh, half of his clinicians showed them a simple tool uh, that they were using with uh, uh, an iPhone camera or an iPad camera and a ruler uh, with their patients. And uh, he realized that they literally had a $1 uh, tool uh, to address the, the, the problem that he, he thinks he was addressing. So he abandoned that approach and he's now pivoted and uh, he has some other ideas that he's out testing uh, again. So uh, to me that was, uh, he was thrilled with the result and I was happy for him because he spent, uh, instead of spending, a, as I said, tens of thousands of dollars de developing a product that at the end of the day, uh, nobody would want. So in summary, uh, you're in business for customers. That's why we're all here. Uh, the message here is please go out and not talk to customers, but listen to customers. And my advice to you is spend some money on VOC before you spend millions of dollars of your own money or somebody else's money developing a product or service that no one wants. And again, last but not least, voice of customer never ends. And with that, I'll stop and I'll answer questions. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, if does anybody have questions, please drop them into the Q&A box. Um, I just wanted to get started and um, ask the very simple question. Um, when should, you know, a company or an entrepreneur start VOC? Like before they even have the idea or they have a concept? Yeah, so if they, yeah, if they have a concept or an idea, uh, whatever that might be, they're thinking of starting a business around an idea or a concept. They, again, develop the concept a little bit to try and identify what problem it's going to solve or how it's going to improve somebody's life or business life. And that's when they should actually start the VOC process. Now, can you shed some light in regards to using SurveyMonkey? Yeah, I'm generally opposed strongly against SurveyMonkey. So writing surveys is, an, is, a, uh, is both an art and a skill. Depending on how you write the questions, you can actually bias the results. So uh, unless you're an expert in writing uh, surveys, uh, I wouldn't use SurveyMonkey because more often than not, the data is going to come back biased. Um, and you also have to keep in mind that the people you're going to be addressing, not all of them uh, are coming from your culture. 
and from your language and therefore how you write the questions can be interpreted in a multitude of ways. So I'm generally opposed to survey monkeys uh, unless, as I said, it's, it's good as a follow-up uh, process to maybe test a hypothesis. Uh, but I would again find a consultant and I'm not that consultant who can actually write the questions the correct way and also add questions in the survey which are validation questions for somebody's response. So typically what we would do in a survey monkey, let's say we would be asking 100 questions, sprinkled th throughout that would be 10 questions or five, five areas, 10 questions that are really asking the same question several different ways and seeing if we get the same answer. And if we don't get the same answer, we've just invalidated the whole response because the other way they're answering the questions. Um, so long answer, I, I generally speaking don't like surveys. Uh, unless it's much later in the process uh, where you're perhaps doing a trade-off analysis around cost versus time, that, then it could be a lot easier. But you're, you're, now, um, you're now asking a very finite set of questions uh, around trade-off. So now I know you gave the recommendation for folks not to talk about their product um, you know, or their idea um, you know, when they're engaging um, the, um, the client. So how, how do you think clients should, um, you know, a company should approach, um, you know, the client before, as they're talking about like wanting to do a survey? So this technique I, I do right now is, uh, and it's, again, if you're coming out of university, it's great because I use the, I'm doing research for a class. I'm doing research, uh, for a business. Uh, I'm really interested in, in this or that, and I'm trying to find out more uh, about how you do this. So it's, it's a research project. Uh, and I don't even mention, even if it's for a company, I don't even mention the company's name, try and, try and do it blinded. Uh, so we've used that, I still use that very successfully. Uh, a lot of us uh, in, in this industry have university affiliations that we can use. And we actually do it under a university affiliation. But other times I use under my consultant business and I'd say, hey, I'm a consultant. I happen to do research in, in a specific area. And people respond to that fairly well. Again, sometimes they want to get paid. And that question does come up. Well, how much will you pay me? Uh, and, and typically I do say a budget of about $200 an interview, uh, especially if I'm talking to physicians. Gotcha. Now, um, at any point, do you ever introduce the idea of your of the product to the potential customer, or at the very least, um, you know, the uh, scientific principles that are involved? Nope. I try not to at all. What I try and do is focus on my interview and get the information at the end. Again, I thank the person for the interview. I ask them for other recommendations. And I say, uh, is it okay? I might say that we're developing a product. Is it okay if we come back in the future uh, to talk about it? Uh, the second you mention your product, unless it's at the you, you've just biased it. You, the, the bias is there. And again, I, I can tell you story after story about people have come to me and they said, we talked to 50 customers and they all love my idea. And they developed a product and not a single one of those people would buy the product. Very few customers will feel comfortable. They don't know you as you, Talk about your customer. People are proud about their babies. It's, I have this most beautiful baby in the world. So they they just love talking about their baby. And the customer's not going to tell you your baby's ugly. 
unless they're from Philadelphia like me, and they, in which case they might, but they don't usually like to give you negative feedback. So you don't hear negative feedback. Uh, so, so therefore the results end up being biased. Great, and what point do you re-engage them? Like, let's say you, you know, you've done the VOC. Um, do you bring the same folks back? You know, um, sometimes I do. Uh, again, if I've developed a good rapport with them, once I've now developed the product, sometimes I'll go again. Sometimes I go back to them if I can, because I haven't gotten to all my answers. Uh, I haven't got to all my questions. I really don't understand how important price is. So price is a difficult topic to bring up. Uh, so sometimes we have to go back to get clarity. But eventually I do like to, for those that I've established rapport with, uh, and you know it, that you just enjoy talking to them, we go back with, can I come back now and, and actually I want you to give me feedback on my product. But now you have a relationship with that person and they're gonna feel a lot more comfortable telling you that their dislikes about what they're seeing. So to me, it's all about developing a relationship and again, I actually use VOC during the whole process because ultimately I do want that customer to buy my product. So if I've been using them throughout my business process, when it's time to come to market, a subset of them are going to be my first customers.